Yes, please. So I was wanting to talk about how uh, the nakshatras are connected to Varuna because that gives us a good understanding of how the nakshatras actually function. Okay, so a lot of people don't know who Varuna is. Varuna is a deity that's most commonly connected with the ocean, right? Most of us understand him as being connected to oceans. But throughout, um, throughout ancient stories connected to Varuna, he is also connected to other things. Like one of the things that's said about Varuna is that he placed the stars in the firmament. Okay, so he placed the stars in the sky. So he's responsible for the nakshatras. So we know that about him, right? He's also listed as being a deity connected to the skies. And he's also listed as being a deity connected to the ocean. And he's also being listed as a deity connected to cosmic justice, so to speak, or the hand that each one of us is dealt. And he's also a deity that's connected to the truth. So those all sound like different things, but they're not different things. They're not different things. And the, the way to understand the nakshatras is to understand how each of those things is connected. So Varuna is also one of the Adichas, the 12 sons of, or the sons of Aditi. And there are two different listings of these. The Rig Veda lists seven Adichas, while Bhagavata Puran lists 12. And the 12 listed are refer reference to the sun, um, 12 deities connected to the sun. So if we understand astrologically uh, what the sun is, okay, so the sun is the Atman. For those of you who aren't familiar with the terminology, uh, I often like to define uh, to people that the Atman is kind of like the soul of everything. It's a common word for soul. And I usually like to tell people it can be the soul of a coffee cup. It can be a soul of your glass of water. It's just the soul, okay? So in terms of the person and their own individual astrology chart, well, the sun relates to their soul on a certain level, okay? So if Varuna is connected to the sun, then Varuna is also on a certain level connected to the soul, okay? So now we need to kind of make a jump to the moon and understand astrologically what the moon is about. So what does the moon do, right? The moon reflects the light of the sun, doesn't it? And we go through portions of the month where the moon is getting dark, which kind of relates to our own consciousness when we're not able to reflect the light of our soul very well, which for instance, if you, um, people who have a waning moon in their chart, they tend to be more introspective. They go more inside of themselves, right? And when the moon is waxing, it's reflecting more of the light of the sun. So the moon waxes and wanes, whereas the sun just shines. So that gives us a hint, too, that, you know, the soul just goes through its experiences, you know, without necessarily having judgment of what those experiences are all about. Whereas the moon is much more subjective, Right? It sometimes understands the reality of what the soul is experiencing. And maybe reality is not the best word to use. We'll revisit that word here in a second. Um, it understand, sometimes it understands the reality of what the soul is going through. But sometimes it sees things from a completely different perspective that's more tainted by the emotions or sensory perceptions. So the moon is manas or our sensory mind or our consciousness in general, which waxes and wanes in association uh, with the light of the sun, okay? So the Varuna is mentioned as the Lord of the waters and also water creatures. And he relates to the oceanic consciousness of God, which is the consciousness of God that's vast and deep. Now, if we understand the ocean waves that we witness, they're affected by the moon's gravitational pull on the earth. Spend some time near the sea, you'll, you'll see that. You know, like when the moon's waxing and waning, you'll see different things happening with the tides. Now, Krishna states that amongst water creatures, he is Varuna. So going back to the uh, planets being incarnations of Vishnu, the moon is the incarnation of Vishnu that is Krishna. 
okay? So if Krishna is the moon and Varuna and Krishna are one and the same, then we know that Krishna and Varuna and the moon are all connected. So Varuna is also a deity of the moon. So Varuna is the presiding deity of the moon and equally the deity of oceans. So Varuna placed the nakshatras in the sky. And each night Varuna is the moon visits a different nakshatra. When he visits each of these individual nakshatras, he creates waves of consciousness that make us behave in a certain way. So what does the moon also do, right? So the moon reflects the light of the sun, but the moon also is a satellite of the earth. It rotates around the earth, okay? So the moon is very deeply connected to our earthbound experience. Just as our consciousness, which waxes and wanes, is connected to our earthbound experience. Okay? And the earth and the moon rotate around the sun, which is the Atman or the soul. So our, our earthbound experience and our perception of that rotates around our soul. Okay, so there's a connection between all of those things. So Varuna as the moon is meant to bridge the Atman, or more specifically the Pada Atman, or the Supreme Soul, with the earthbound consciousness of the individual, which is the Jiva Atman. And it's interesting because there's um, these sections of Taitariya Brahmana that I was talking about earlier. Each of these Nakshatra Sutras that are listed there have a section that says padastat from above and avastat from below. So what each of those sutras do is explain how the nakshatras unite the individual soul with the supreme soul. So we understand that really the function of nakshatras is to unite the individual soul with the supreme soul. The rashis or the body parts of you know God personified or the areas of our life in specific, which is what the Babas represent, which are a function of the uh, Rashis, those are the areas of our life that the drama is playing itself out in. But it's the planets and the nakshatras that are very, very deeply responsible for explaining how we're going through that. So we understand the sun. The sun makes sacrifices. The sun is, is steadfast. The sun can sometimes be prideful. We understand the moon. The moon is uh, reflective. The moon is also a creeping planet. Uh, it's listed as a creeping planet, which means it will uh, go this way and go that way. It will adapt to situations. Mars is very you know, direct. It can be very forceful. Those are different types of energies, right? So then when you equally have those different nakshatra energies, which if you've ever looked at the texts uh, that contain the different qualities of nakshatras, you'll see that there are so many different qualities that are connected to each nakshatra. And it's really confusing when you look at that because you go, well, there are so many different, how am I supposed to interpret that? different planets will bring out different aspects of the nakshatras, right? And that's an important thing. Um, houses, the houses that the drama is playing itself out in will also bring out different qualities of the nakshatras. And so they're a bridge, but they're a very multifaceted bridge. And they're very difficult for most people to understand because because they're related to our consciousness, which is very subjective. So in order to understand the nakshatras, you have to have an experience of the nakshatras. You can read all this information about them in a text, but you'll look at all these different qualities and you'll go, I'm still confused. Until you begin to put it in practice every day. A good way to put it into practice is to, regardless of which panchanga you're using or what calculations you're using, is to note the movement of the moon every day. And try to tune in to what's happening in your life in association with that movement. And that'll help you to understand the nakshatras on a deeper level. But, you know, going back to our, our conversation, there's also a section of Brihat Parasha or Horus Shastra that if you put all this information together, it kind of explains how astrology works, right? Whereas if you ask most people how astrology works, if you ask me how astrology works, I, I, I would still go, well, scientifically, I can't explain it to you. 
right? But if I go to the metaphysical level, it begins to make a lot, a lot more sense, right? And there's a particular section of Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, I think, that explains it really wonderfully. It says, the Lord is in all beings. The Lord is in all beings. Everybody has God in them. And the entire universe is in God. The entire universe is in God. All beings contain both jivatma, individual soul, and paramatma amshas, or supreme soul divisions. Some have predominance of supreme soul, or rather predominance of jivatman, or individual soul, while some have the latter in predominance. So some people have more supreme soul in predominance, right? So that particular sutra goes on to say something about the planet, saying Paramatmamsha is predominant in the Grahas, the sun, etc., and equally in Brahma, Shiva, and the other deities. But it also says their powers or consorts, their powers or consorts, because it's the consorts of each deity that are known to carry the Shakti of that particular deity. So their powers or consorts, too, have predominance of Paramatmamsha. Others have more of Jivatmamsha. So if we understand that on a certain level, who is the moon? The moon is Varuna, right? Uh, the moon is also Krishna, right? The moon is the, can represent the oceanic consciousness of God. Varuna is also connected to the sun, though. So the sun and the moon are both one and the same on a certain level. The Atman and the consciousness, so those are both one and the same. But in addition to that, the nakshatras are listed as being the wives of the moon. So they carry the power of the moon. Equally, they carry the power of the sun. So they carry both the power of the supreme soul and the individual's perception of what their consciousness is experiencing, which is more related to the moon. They carry both of those things. And so in essence, what the nakshatras do is they give us an experience that helps us to grow our consciousness in a certain type of way. And they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal and completely elusive, and they'll baffle you constantly. <laughs> right? You know, and if you talk to most astrologers and you ask them uh, the thing that they have the hardest time with interpreting, most of them will tell you it's the nakshatras, because we don't really have any systems, any strong systems listed in any of the ancient texts that define how to work with nakshatras. It's, it, it's something that on a certain level is missing because it's a certain uh, concept that we can't fully fit our minds around. Because if we want to practice the uh, science of astrology, then we're wanting to focus more on objective things. Okay, because if we do subjective testing, then we're not certain of our evidence, right? So we like for astrology to be very scientific, but the nakshatras in general are subjective. They are subjective. And so it's my firm belief that astrology is not just a science, it's also an art. Okay, and Whilst you need good, solid, concrete techniques to do astrology, you also need good intuition. You need good intuition because there are certain aspects of astrology that you're not going to be able to sort out simply, right? So when you have that combination, and I may be going off on a tangent here, so please pardon me. When you have that combination of concrete techniques, and equally intuition. That's when you can make wonders work astrologically. But it's important to have both of those because if you don't have the good analytical techniques, well, some days you might be having a lousy day <laughs> and your intuition is just off, you know? And, and you need to, you know, that's when, I mean, good solid techniques help you all the time, but that's especially when good solid concrete reproductible techniques come in very handy because if you're just doing intuitive astrology sometimes your intuition can fail but if you're just doing purely scientific astrology then things won't always 
match up, you know, because basically we can't perfect God. Astrology is an imperfect science because we're just mortals. We have something really wonderful with Vedic astrology, which, you know, lets us get amazingly high accuracy in understanding God's will, which is pretty amazing, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect because it, it doesn't take into consideration, if you're doing it purely scientifically, that the astrologer is an individual. The client is an individual. And when all those different factors come into the uh, laboratory <laughs> experiment, it throws all sorts of variables into the, into the mix. And in trying to sort through those variables, you're not going to have perfection every single time. That's why the best astrologers are, you know, somewhere between, um, you know, 60, 80. I like saying 100% accurate 60 to 80% of the time rather than saying 60 to 80% accurate, right? So you're going to be accurate, 100% accurate, about 60 to 80% of the time. But still, that's pretty good. You know, that's pretty good. But, you know, coming back to nakshatras, they're the part of astrology that's very confusing for most people. But there are little hints that are given to us, you know, throughout the ancient texts. So it's also listed about Varuna, that Varuna covers things over in the night. That Mitra, who's connected to Anuradha nakshatra, reveals during the day. Okay? So um, Varuna is connected with the nakshatras. Varuna is connected with the stars. Varuna is connected with the moon. All those different things have, a, have an interconnection, and they help us to understand the nakshatras. So in short... Some things I'm wanting people to really take away from this conversation, if I had to like summarize things, are the facts that the zodiac and the nakshatras are two separate things. We can under so when you're looking at a chart and you're using astrology software, sure, you're going to see those things combined, but it's important to understand that you're looking at two different things joined together for the convenience of you being able to interpret that and make it into an astrological interpretation. But the essence of it is the fact that they're two separate things. The, um, the zodiac is the, as I mentioned earlier, is the ecliptic split into 12 equal portions, uh, or the sky split into 12 equal portions, whereas the nakshatras are the sky split into 27 different portions. The zodiac is more connected to the ecliptic, which can be mapped to the fixed stars, but the sphere of the fixed stars is a completely um, individual thing. And it's important to understand it as that. On a certain level, uh, for people who understand more of the astronomical side of astrology, um, if you understand that Rahu and Ketu are like nodes, which is where the path of the moon and the path of the sun cross each other, well, the nakshatras on a certain level are nodes as well. They're where the uh, sphere of the stars intersects the sphere of the ecliptic or the zodiac. And so they behave in a similar way as the nodes. They're there to help us to grow karmically. You were going to say something, I think. No, I'm, I'm like, it's interesting the point which you made that, uh, in a way, sun and moon are also like very similar. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I mean, that's what I also think because generally when we see charts, like, as you said, nakshatras or zodiacs, like the person has sun placed in this sign or moon placed there. It is, I think it's literally impossible to say that, oh, you know, when you are emotionally, you behave like this. When you are not emotionally, that's your son. Then you behave like this. I, I don't think, I mean, at least I can't do that. I mean, I cannot segregate both of them. I just say these two traits are very prominent in you. And the person is like, yes, you are right. So it's next to impossible to, I mean, at least for me or at a personal level to exactly discriminate <laughs> because they're very similar as consciousness that, as you said, that's a very amazing point. Well, the sun and the moon are the luminaries, right? So the luminaries tend to, um, tend to show us who we truly are. You see, I would say if you're trying to understand the separation between them, which is very difficult to do, the, uh, 
the moon is more adaptable, is more uh, emotional in nature, whereas the sun's very dry. So like, in other words, if you had the sun in a nakshatra, the individual, you would likely find that the individual, for the most part, dependent upon the state of the sun, of course, would go, well, that's, a, that's, that's who I am, right? That's the side of the person that you'll likely find them saying more, that's who I am, take it or leave it, <laughs> okay? Whereas the lunar quality, it's, it's, it's more adaptable. It's more adaptable and it's more subjective and more reflective with the individual. But yeah, it is hard to really segregate the two. And it's because they're both aspects of the self. How amazing it is. All right. So we'll continue the next part in the next video. Okay. So stay tuned, mm -hmm. everybody.